Okay, in this video, we're gonna talk a little bit more about probability, and we're gonna start out by talking about something called compound probability. And a compound probability is just a probability involving two or more events. For example, event A and event B. So up to now, all the probabilities we've been calculating are just the probability of one thing happening. Well, we're getting ready to talk about probability that two or more things, two or more events, will happen. So for example, example number one here says, what is the probability of flipping a coin twice and having it come up heads both times? Well, we've already talked about flipping a coin. If we flip a coin just one time, and we want to calculate the probability that that one coin flip will result in heads, then this is just the number of ways that this event can happen divided by the total number of outcomes. And for flipping a coin, this is not that hard to calculate. The number of possible outcomes, it's either heads or tails, so we only have two outcomes. And there's only one way that this particular event can happen. It can only come up heads one way, so our probability then is one half. Well, if I want to know the probability of flipping a coin twice and having it come up heads both times, this is a compound probability. And notice that I could write this probability statement as the probability of the first flip is heads and the probability that the second flip is heads. And this just kind of highlights the fact that I'm talking about two events here. So let's take a look at this. How many different possible outcomes are there? What's the total number of outcomes if I'm flipping two coins, if I'm flipping or, or flipping the same coin twice? So I could get heads on the first flip, and I could get heads on the second flip. Or I could get heads on the first flip and then tails on the second flip. I could get tails on the first flip and heads on the second flip. Or I could get tails and tails. So these are all of the possible outcomes that I could have. So I've got a total of four possible outcomes. So then using my probability formula here, my total number of possible outcomes would be four. Well, what's the number of ways that this particular event can happen? That is, my first flip comes up heads and my second flip comes up heads. Well, the number of ways that that could happen is just one of those four possible outcomes. It's this first one here. So there's only one way that this particular event can happen. So the probability, this compound probability of these two events is one fourth. Now, there's another way that I could go about calculating this probability, and when we have more complicated probability problems, the second way is often easier. Notice that if I write my probability this way, the probability of this event and the probability of this event, if I look at just the probability of this first event, the probability that my first coin flip comes up heads is going to be one half. That's this probability right here. The probability of my second coin flip coming up heads, it's also one half. Well, if I take each of these two individual probabilities and if I multiply them together, then I get one fourth, which is the probability of both events happening together. This is something called the multiplication rule. And notice that this is going to be important when we're using the multiplication rule. Notice that both of these two different events, this first coin flip and the second coin flip, notice that neither one of these events has any effect on the other one. In particular, this second coin flip, the, the, whatever I get on my first coin flip, it doesn't have any impact at all on this second coin flip. That's what we call independent events. Okay, in this video we're going to talk about something called the multiplication rule. Now, as we've seen before, if we want to calculate the probability of two events happening together, say, flipping a coin two times and finding out what's the probability of the coin coming up heads both times, well, we can just calculate the probability of the first event 
flipping the coin the first time, and calculate the probability of the second event, which is flipping the coin the second time. And we can just multiply those two probabilities together to find out, well, what's the probability of getting heads the first flip and also getting heads the second flip. So we might be tempted to say, well, then the formula, the rule then, if I want to calculate the probability of two events happening together, that rule, the probability of event A and event B happening, well, you just take the probability of the first event and multiply it times the probability of the second event, and there's our rule. Except, it turns out that very often, the probability of the second event, that is, how likely it is that the second event is going to happen, depends on what happens in the first event. And so the way we take care of that in this formula is that we don't actually just write you know, the probability of these two events happening is the probability of event A times the probability of event B. We write it like this. We say the probability of event A and event B happening is the probability of event A happening times the probability of event B given that event A has already happened. And this notation that you see right here, the B and then the vertical line and then A, that just means the probability of event B given that, that little vertical line means given that, the probability of event B given that event A has already happened. So let's take a look at how we might use this formula in this example here. It says a bag contains four blue marbles, six green marbles, and three yellow marbles. If two marbles are drawn at random from the bag, what's the probability of first drawing a green marble and then drawing a yellow marble? Okay, so we've seen examples like this before with the marbles in a bag. And now we're going to take a look at the way that we will go about calculating this probability of drawing two marbles from a bag. And we're going to do it in two different ways because it turns out there's two different possible answers we could get to this. We're going to talk about doing this marble drawing with replacement and then without replacement. So I want to draw these two marbles from the back. So I've got my two events. My first event is drawing the green marble, and my second event is drawing the yellow marble. And if I want to calculate the probability of drawing a green marble and then drawing a yellow marble, then I just need to, and if I'm going to do it with what I'm going to do it with what's called with replacement. That is, after I draw the first marble, I'm going to put it back in the bag before I draw my second marble. All right. So my second event then, before I, you know, before I do my second event. I'm going to put that first marble back. All right, so I should be able to write down the probability of drawing a green marble and then drawing a yellow marble. Well, that's just multiplying these two probabilities. So the probability of drawing a green marble times the probability of drawing a yellow marble given that I drew a green marble first. So if I can calculate these two probabilities, then I'm just going to multiply them together, and that will tell me the probability of drawing a green and a yellow marble. Okay. Well, what's the probability of drawing a green marble? Well, let's see. I've got 13 marbles in the bag. How many of them are green? Six. So there's the probability of drawing my green marble. What's the probability of drawing a yellow marble given that I've already drawn a green marble from the bag? Well, since I'm doing this marble drawing experiment with replacement, that is, I draw my first marble, I look at it, and then I put it back in the bag before I draw my second marble, it turns out that drawing the first marble doesn't have any effect at all on drawing the second marble. I draw this first marble, I put it back in the bag, now when I go to draw my second marble, I still have 13 marbles in the bag, and I want to know the probability of drawing a yellow marble. Well, let's see, three of those marbles are yellow, so this second probability, I could just as well have written, you know, what's the probability of just drawing a yellow marble? Because the probability of drawing a yellow marble, given that I've already drawn a green marble, that doesn't change anything about my probability. So here's my first probability. Here's my second probability. I multiply those together, and I get, let's see, 18 over 169. And if I punch that in and get a decimal, I'm going to get 0.107. Okay, well, so that's the probability of drawing a green marble and a yellow marble if I do it with replacement. Let's take a look at what happens if I do it without replacement. I'm still doing this same, I'm still going to use this same formula. 
In other words, the probability of drawing a green marble and drawing a yellow marble is the probability of drawing a green marble times the probability of drawing a yellow marble given that I've already drawn a green marble. Except now I'm going to do this experiment without replacement. That is, I'm not going to put the first marble back. I'm going to draw the first marble and I'm not going to put it back before I draw the second marble. So let's see how that's going to affect my probabilities here. So my first event, drawing a green marble, I want to know what's the probability. Well, how many marbles do I have in the bag? I've got 13 marbles in the bag. How many of them are green? Six. So that first probability is exactly the same as it was over here. Now, when I go to draw my second marble this time, however, since I'm doing this without replacement, I've already drawn one marble from the bag and I'm not putting it back. So now all of a sudden things are different because I no longer have 13 marbles in the bag. I only have 12 marbles in the bag. So now I want to know what's the probability, when, and that's what I mean when I say the probability of drawing a yellow marble given that I've already drawn a green marble. I've got one less marble in the bag. Now how many of those 12 marbles, how many of them are yellow? Well, there are still three yellow marbles in the bag. So now this is the probability of drawing a yellow marble given that I've already drawn a green marble. Because I'm doing this without replacement, it changes this probability of my second event. Well, now I have these two probabilities. Now I can just multiply them together. And here I get 18 over 13 times 12 is 156. And if I punch this into my calculator to write it as a decimal, then that would be 0.115. So you see I get a different probability depending on whether I do my experiment without replacement or whether I do it with replacement. Notice, however, that my formula, the formula here for the probability of two events, it still works regardless of whether I'm doing it with replacement or without replacement. The only thing that changes is the probability of this second event. Now, you've got another example there in your notes. I want you to try that one on your own, and we'll take a look at that answer in class. Okay, in this video, we're going to take a look at something called Venn diagrams. So let's take a look at the example in your notes. It says, 21 students at Riverside High School are allergic to either peanuts, shellfish, or both. 14 students are allergic to peanuts, 12 are allergic to shellfish. How many are allergic to both peanuts and shellfish? Okay, so we've got this diagram here, which is kind of a basic Venn diagram, and you can see there are these kind of overlapping ovals. And each one of the ovals represents, in this case, students who are allergic to peanuts and students who are allergic to shellfish. So I'm going to write in this oval right here, peanuts. So this is going to represent the number of students who are allergic to peanuts. And over here, I'm going to write shellfish. So this oval is going to represent the, the students who are allergic to shellfish. So it says... 14 students are allergic to peanuts, so presumably I've got 14 students in this oval. And 12 are allergic to shellfish. So I've got 12 students who are allergic to shellfish. But I'm also told that there are a total of 21 students at Riverside High School. Well, if I add up these numbers, students allergic to peanuts, students allergic to shellfish, well, I get 14 plus 12 is 28, I've got too many students. I've only got a total of 21 students who are allergic to peanuts and shellfish, and I can see the problem. There are apparently some students at Riverside who are allergic to both peanuts and shellfish, so they're going to go in this, that, that number of students is going to go in this space right here. In other words, they're going to be part of this oval, and they're also going to be a part of the shellfish oval. The question is, how many? Well, I know that when I'm done, the number of students allergic to peanuts and the number of stu students allergic to shellfish and the number of students allergic to both has to add up to 21. So at this point, I don't know exactly how many students there are who are allergic to both. So let me just start out by saying, well, maybe there is, actually let me write one, write both here, since that space in there is students who are allergic to both. Let me start out by saying, well, maybe there is just one student who's allergic to both peanuts and shellfish. Well. If I'm going to put one student here who's allergic to both peanuts and shellfish, well, I've only got a total of 14 who are allergic to peanuts. 
one of them now I'm saying is allergic to both, so I need to subtract one from my 14. Now I've still got a total of 14 here allergic to peanuts, and I need to subtract one from the number who are allergic to shellfish. So now I still have a total of 14 students allergic to peanuts, a total of 12 allergic to shellfish, and one of those is allergic to both. Well, now if I add up my numbers here, I've got 13 plus 11 plus 1. 13 plus 11 plus 1. That's 25 students. I still have too many students. Well, let me add another student in here. Say I've got two allergic to shellfish. Well, I need to subtract another one from here. That brings me down to 12. It's going to bring me down to 10 over here. And now I've got 12 allergic to peanuts, 10 allergic to shellfish, 2 allergic to both. Now I'm down to 20 four students. I'm still not down to 21. Well, let's go with, let's try three. I need to subtract again. 11. Subtract one over here. That brings me to nine. Now let's see. Now I'm at 11, nine, and three. 11, nine, three. That's 23. Still have too many. Let's add one more to the both category. Subtract another one here. Subtract another one here. Now I'm at 10, 8, and 4. Let's see, 18, 22. I think I see where this is going. I think if I add one more to the both category, I have to subtract that one from here, and I have to subtract that one from here. Now let's see, I've got 9 students allergic to peanuts, 7 allergic to shellfish, 5 allergic to both, 9 and 7 is 16, 16 and 5 is 21, and this here I've got my correct numbers now in my Venn diagram. I have nine students allergic to peanuts, seven students allergic, nine students allergic to peanuts only, seven students allergic to shellfish only, and five students who are allergic to both. And when I add all those up, I get my total of 21 students at Riverside who are allergic to peanuts or shellfish. All right, now let's take a look at this next example. The, the previous example was kind of a basic Venn diagram, but actually to have a complete diagram, we need this additional box around it. I'm going to show you what that's used for here in just a minute. So the example says, out of a group of 60 students, 21 signed up for chorus, 29 signed up for band, and 5 take both. Put this information into a Venn diagram. Okay, so I'm going to do it basically like I did before. I'm going to let this oval here represent the number of students who signed up for chorus. I'm going to let this oval represent the number of students who signed up for band. And this oval, or this part of both ovals where they overlap, that's going to represent the students who signed up for both chorus and band. All right, so now this tells me 21 signed up for chorus, 29 signed up for band, and 5 take both. Well, let me start with that number. 5 students take both. Now, if 21 total signed up for chorus, but I know five students are also taking chorus and band, well, then I need, I need to subtract that five from my 21 who signed up for chorus. So 21 minus five is 16. So I have 16 students who are signed up for chorus only, five students who are signed up for both chorus and band, which means I have a total of 21 students who are signed up for chorus. So according to my example here, I've got 29 who are signed up for band, but five of those are also signed up for chorus, so I need to subtract that five from my 29 students who signed up for band. So 29 minus five, that's 24. So I have 24 students who are signed up for band only, plus the five who are signed up for both band and chorus, which means I have a total of 29 students who are signed up for band. Okay. Well, now I know how many students I have in chorus only, band only, and both. But notice I'm also told I have a total of 60 students. Well, so far here I've got 16 plus 5 plus 24. And if I add those together, let's see, I get 15, 45. That's only 45 students. And I'm told in my example that I have a total of 60 students. Well, if I've only got 45 here who are signed up for chorus or band or both, 
that must mean I have 15 students who aren't signed up for either of these. And that number we put here in the box, but outside of the two ovals. So 15 are signed up for neither chorus nor band. Now I've got enough information here. This is my complete Venn diagram. Now I have enough information here to answer these questions there at the bottom of the page. So I'm going to leave those for you, and we'll take a look at this in class.